Professor Atkinson's work actually inspired the Baymax in this um, in this movie. So we're gonna learn a lot more about it today. So we're so happy to have him here. Uh, before we start, I'm just gonna do a quick introduction about uh, who we are. So we're a program called Create and Learn. We teach students uh, a wide variety of computer science classes. I am a professor at Carnegie Mellon University in something called the Robotics Institute. It's essentially a department that totally focuses on robots both on robot bodies and also how to build robot brains or AI. And on this slide, uh, I show you uh, my email address and also my webpage. And I also put a copy of these slides on the web. And if the videos aren't very good, you can try to download it during the class or after the class and get a much better idea of what's going on with the videos. And let's get this going. I want to start out with a question, and I encourage you to type your answer into the chat window. And that is, what do you want a robot to do with you or for you? You want it to be your servant, do your chores, or do your chores with the robot? Uh, a lot of you have to drive around to all sorts of additional uh, things you do. I'm sure your parents get tired of it. Maybe a robot car could drive you around. Uh, maybe you could play with a robot or even we have fantasy football teams. We could have physical fantasy football teams where the players were robots. Uh, you could have your robot help you learn or maybe just go to school for you. Uh, Hopefully a robot could take you on exciting adventures, could keep you safe, and even be your friend. So, so what do you guys want your robots to do for you? Cooking, save the turtles. Actually, if we all stay inside, the turtles are really happy. Uh, everything, that, that's going to be uh, uh, challenging, but I see a lot of people would like the robot to do everything. All righty. So what am I going to talk about? Uh, in the next hour. Uh, well, I'm first gonna talk a little bit about the robots I've worked with. What do I do every day? And a little bit about what can robots do and ask a question, should a robot look like a human or act like a human? Uh, and then the question, how can we make robots safe so you can have one at home? And uh, then talk a little bit about how the Baymax thing came about. Uh, it, this is a juggling robot I worked on a while ago. Uh, we didn't have very good robot hands, so you can see it has kitchen funnels for hands. Uh, and that's what it looks like from the robot's eyeballs. This is a task called devil sticking. And again, the robot is seeing the colored balls and then batting the stick back and forth. That's me in the background. Uh, why do I build robots? I want to help people. I want to understand how people work, how our bodies and brains work. And it's a really a lot of fun to get a robot to do this kind of thing. It's very exciting. And here's an example of a robot helping someone lift a table. And the student, this is a graduate student, is trying to test the robot by moving the table around. And he wants to see, is the robot going to fall? And later, after the robot revolution, if the robot's angry about being pushed around like this, maybe it'll come back, come back and go after that graduate student. Here's an example of something that's very difficult, even for humans, is walking on loose rocks. If you look at the robot's feet while it's doing this, you'll see the rocks move and you could easily sprain your ankle doing this kind of thing and actually soak in the robot. So this is another way we sort of test if our robot is going to not fall down. Uh, one of the things, it's, a, it's very, uh, it's a lot of work to program a robot to get it to do anything. So what we'd really like is to have robots learn uh, Maybe not in the same way that humans learn, but humans do uh, acquire the ability to do a wide range of tasks. 
In this case, the robot was watching the human balance a pole on its, uh, in its hand. This is something you can do at home with a broomstick. If you get a shorter stick, it's much harder. So you can see how short a stick you can do. Now I'm gonna show you the robot if it didn't have a teacher. And if it didn't have a teacher, it's starting from scratch. And you can see that this time it's dropping the pole. Whereas if it had a teacher, it didn't drop the pole at all. So in case you're wondering, this is evidence why teachers are good for you. They help you learn faster. Uh, there are two kinds of learning going on here. One's imitating a teacher, and the other is practicing, going off the robot and practicing by itself. And you see the weight on the top of the stick? Uh, we're gonna remove that weight, and that changes how the stick works. And the robot's gonna have to learn how to balance the stick after it's changed. So that's the top of the stick without the weight, and here we go. It almost is able to do it, but then it drops it. Oh, yeah, okay, looks like it got it the second time. So having experience on one task helps it learn a second task better or faster. Okay. Here's another example. That's a young me. That's a paint roller. And what I'm doing is a task called swing up. This is after learning and the robot can do what I did. And now I'm going to move my hand back and forth twice. So it's a little different style and the robot learns how to do it the way I did it. Okay. Now I want to show you all the learning, how much practice the robot had to do. So this is the original demonstration. This is the robot's first try. It's not very good. This is the robot's second try. It's getting better. The robot's third try. The robot's fourth try. And that's the fifth try. It's learning very fast. This is a harder thing to do, the double pump, because you have to get the right energy into the first swing and then preserve it during the second swing. That wasn't good at all. This is the second try, not so good. Third try, also not so good. Fourth try, it's not even getting the thing, of the yellow ball above the red ball. Oh, here we go, we're getting, making progress. And whoops, too far. Now, many people watching this video think the robot gets angry at this point and is just swinging the thing around. But in reality, this robot has no feelings. It's not programmed to have emotion. Okay, in about eight tries, it was able to do the task. Here's another example of robot learning. In this case, these are two human beings, not robots. The one on the right is a graduate student. We replaced the one on the left. And what we did is we recorded all the hits that that person made made a library of the hits and then essentially put them in the head of the robot and now when the robot sees the puck in this air hockey coming towards it it looks into its library of what the uh, the teacher did and says i'm going to do something similar i wanted to give you a little historical perspective here are some walking robots from 50 years ago when I was 10 years old. And as you can see, they're very slow. This is actually a robot piano player that's providing the music for this. And they, these are a lot of these are Japanese robots. They're balancing all the time. You could yell at them freeze and they could freeze and not fall over, which is something that's not true when you're walking. Here's about 10 years later, uh, this is a, when the leg laboratory was at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, and they were actually exploring robots that had the balance in the sense that you can't yell freeze at this robot because if you do and it freezes, it'll just fall over. It doesn't have a big foot and it only has one leg. So this forced them to study balance. And here we have a two-legged version on what's called a boom. And I want to let you know that the girl in the picture I eventually married, that's my wife, 
Uh, okay, so here we're running fast. So this robot can fall forwards and backwards, but it can't fall sideways because of the boom. Here it's going up and down some stairs. Here it's jumping over something. And here it's gonna do a flip. And there's my wife again. Now, eventually they got the biped off the boom. And this is the first time that particular robot was able to do a flip. So everyone's very excited. Here it is off the treadmill and doing a flip. It's a happy robot. This is a quadruped, a four-legged robot going down the hall. Those are professors' offices and classrooms. The robot makes a lot of noise and they have to put tape on the floor to mark it. And here, we, their lab wasn't big enough. And here again, their lab's not gonna be big enough. But you can see in slow motion, the robot doing its thing. Okay, now, about 40 years later, the same set of people have developed, formed the company Boston Dynamics, and they've actually gotten their robot to do pretty amazing things. I want you to look, though, at the bottom of its chest, and you will see cracks and where it dented itself. So it's not perfect. You see the crack? It has actually two cracks. So right at the bottom of that chest. And now you'll see it without the cracks. Here they had it walking outdoors in the slow snow. And it looks pretty clumsy, but the point of this video is to show you how skillful it is that when the foot slip, it doesn't fall down. Uh, and that's pretty amazing. As I'm getting older, it's harder and harder for me to do the right thing when I slip. Uh, so I'm very impressed with this robot. I wanted to share with you, uh, I live in Pittsburgh where Carnegie Mellon is, where the Robotics Institute is. And we have a lot of robot car companies. And so these are all pictures of robot cars in Pittsburgh. You can see the green bus in the lower right corner. And a lot of Pittsburgh in the upper right is this brick stuff. Carnegie Mellon is on the upper left. We have a lot of bridges, which you can see in the lower left. So we've got a lot of robots here in Pittsburgh. This is a robot that I saw one day going down the sidewalk. It's supposed to deliver food to lazy students who didn't want to get out of their dorms. Originally, it sounded like, wow, that's a, a real luxury. Why don't they just get out of the dorms, get some exercise, go get some food? But now that we're all stuck in our homes, these kinds of delivery ro robots are very handy because they don't get sick and they don't make you sick. So that's really nice. And I was in the supermarket and I ran into this robot. You can see it has on the left video googly eyes to make it look happy. In the second video, it's standing on top of a spilled uh, object and those are its angry eyes because it's summoned the people to come clean it up. In the third video, I threw a piece of paper on the floor and tried to get the robot to pick it up. And unfortunately, I couldn't. But if we wait on the right-hand video, you can see six, where it successfully picks up the piece of paper. You can see as people walk by this thing, you know, after a while, they don't react to it at all. It makes a lot of noise. That guy, he's just shopping. I don't care this robot behind me. Okay, so on the right-hand side, I'm going to move past it. There are the googly eyes. Yeah, hi, robot. It's got a smiling face. And I threw a piece of paper on the floor, and this time it ate the paper. See, it got the paper. It's kind of like a big vacuum cleaner. The problem was that that piece of paper was actually my shopping list. So I actually, after it ate the paper, I couldn't get it back. And I had no idea what I was supposed to buy. Uh, recently, to help uh, doctors and nurses in the hospitals, people have been trying to put various robots in the hospitals. And, you know, that's just starting out, so they're not yet all that useful, but it's clear 
uh, that we, when we have these dangerous diseases, it's very helpful to have robots helping us because robots don't get sick. Here, I wanted to show you some of the uh, robots in my home. I have three floors, so I have three different robot vacuum cleaners because I'm trying them out. And on the right is something called a Vector. This is a, from a company, Anki, that actually was some Carnegie Mellon students from the Robotics Institute. Unfortunately, although the products were fantastic, uh, they had a cash flow problem and went out of business. But uh, I, we really, my wife and I really enjoy interacting with this little robot on our kitchen table. And I enjoy launching all the vacuum cleaners uh, every week and having them clean. Now, I have a question for you, uh, which you can answer on the chat. Are my dishwasher and washing machine robots? And what do you think? Yes or no? And in, which, in that case, like, what's the definition of a robot? If a robot is something that moves, the dishwasher and washing machine move. If it's something that has sensors, things that measure stuff, the dishwasher and the washing machine clearly measure stuff, at least modern ones. And do they think? And yeah, di my dishwasher and washing machines have computers in them. So yeah, they think. So my vote is yes. What did you guys vote? Hey, yeah, I got all yeses. That's fantastic. Practically everything is a robot. You always, uh, okay, here's another question for the chat window. Should a robot look like a human? So in this picture, there are three humans and three robots that are copies of the three humans. And the three copies are really good copies, especially the guy on the right. films that are about how when I when um, and let me just explain what was going on here. Uh, this is a research effort where they're trying to figure out, well, if robots are like people, first of all, how do we make them really like people, which means we have to understand people. And second of all, does that make them more useful? Think about okay. films that are about how when, an, this when person a robot androids and humans person? don't get along sometimes. I don't really agree with this so kind of movie. Before it starts talking, um, some Android people are actually fooled. They think it's a real person. A very but when it starts talking, its voice and its lip movements Tadako are not Kaburagi, very good. who is 104 years old, first met Pyro Here at a nursing home in Tokyo. A non -human she lost her husband when he was fighting like in the Philippines seal, during the Second World War and, it's like and a raised robot her three sons on her own as a make farmer. People happy. Interacting with Pyro makes her laugh. This is in Japan. <laughs> They're speaking Japanese. <laughs> He's 104 <laughs> years old. <laughs> now, you actually need to have a robot it looks like an animal or a human. This thing has no head. It has no arms and legs. All it's got is a tail. Is this just as good as that robot seal? You can type into the chat window and vote. The company that sells it, which is also from Japan, thinks, yeah, this is just as good as something that looks like an animal. And here you have someone who has a lot of these robots, and she is so happy. Okay, whoops. And I did the wrong thing. Okay, so here are some robots that, you know, yeah, they sort of look like spiders. They have only six legs, not eight legs. It's got, the one on the left has an arm. But my question to you is, is this a better robot design? You know, one idea is if you have lots of legs, you can put hands on some of them and they can switch between being legs and hands. And if you have a lot of legs, it's much easier to balance. So if you had eight legs, you could still be on four legs and have four arms. In this case, they have six legs. You could stand on four legs and use two of those legs as arms. So maybe that's a much better better robot. Whoops, we have a bug. 
maybe that's a much better robot than those other robots. But here's the question. If you were in a hospital, lying in a hospital bed, would you be happy if a robot like this came to take care of you? Or if you were an old person living in what we call assisted living or a nursing home, would you be happy if this was the robot nurse? So that's my question to you. Okay. Did you ever think it was stupid to have a head? Why is it you only have two eyeballs looking forward? Why don't you have four eyeballs with eyes in the back of your head so you can see all around you? And as long as we're on the subject, why don't you have eyeballs all over your body? We can have ears all over our body. We could have noses all over our body. Yeah, we need a mouth, but you can sort of put that somewhere else. We could get rid of your head entirely. So I've been investigating the idea of let's put eyeballs all over a robot so it can see in all directions. And that's actually a really old idea. In Greece, there's mythology, and there was a guy named Argus who had 100 eyeballs, and he couldn't fall asleep until all his eyes were shut. And in Japan, there's a demon that lives in temples, and it also has many eyeballs. And on the right-hand side, that is the world's smallest camera on top of a finger. So if you think, wow, 100 cameras, that's going to be really bulky. It's too much. We can get really small cameras. Urgh. <laughs> OK, yeah, all right. I'm not sure why the technology failed me there. So here's what happens if your fingers can see. You don't have to touch something, but you can adjust so you're always ready to grab it. And instead of stubbing your fingers on it, you just move with it. So in this case, because we have eyeballs on our fingertips, we can see with our fingers. And if you have eyeballs on your fingertips, you can actually manipulate very delicate things. That was an origami crane without crushing it. And what we're about to look at is a tug of war between the robot and a person where they're both holding on to a marshmallow. So you need very good control of your forces in order to do that. So that's one of my current research ideas. How are we gonna put 100 eyeballs on a robot? Here's another question. Earlier I asked you, well, is a dishwasher and a washing machine robots? And a lot of you said yes. How about the Aware Home? We built this house uh, at Georgia Tech, and it itself is a robot. It looks like a nice house from the inside, from the outside, but from the inside, we filled it with cameras, and it could control the windows and the heating and cooling, and it could even talk to you. And I would argue that the house itself is a robot. Now, this is before we had Alexa and Siri and all this other stuff, so, uh, it was a big deal to get the house to talk to you. Nowadays, it's no big deal. You just buy yourself an Alexa or you use your, if you have an iPhone, you talk to Siri or Google Home or whatever. And pretty much everybody's home and everybody's car is going to be a robot in the sense that you can talk to it. Okay, so now I want to move on to another question, which is, how are we going to make robots safe? So most of the robots I've worked with, and here are two of them, are made out of metal and they have a weight problem. So the robot on the right weighed about 300 pounds. If it fell on you, it would hurt you. If it fell on a child, it might kill the child. If it fell on your pet dog or cat, it might squash the dog or cat. How are we going to have these things in our house helping us if they're so dangerous? So to give you an idea, here's the same robot you saw before, 
and in this case, a graduate student picking it. And I hope this gives you idea sort of how big and heavy it is. It moves very slowly. Now, it's smart enough not to fall down, but if it did fall down, I sure wouldn't want it to fall down on me. And you can see we have safety ropes attached to its head because we don't want it to hurt itself when it falls down. Here are some examples of robots having accidents. So I want to show you uh, one of the robots. So this oh, robot yeah. fell off oh. the stage. That guy was driving it, so it's really his fault. This is a very famous robot from Japan, the Honda Asuna. And it's done many, many of these kinds of shows. I think only twice has fallen down. And the company says, well, it fell down because its computers crashed. So it had no brain at that point. So this is a big problem. It means you can't use a brain to make you safe. Here is back to a Boston Dynamics robot trying to put the box down and just everything goes wrong. Whoops, whoops. Okay, here's another Boston Dynamics robot trying to give somebody, uh, I think a Diet Coke or something. It's not working very well. The robot wants it back. Now notice the can's leaking at this point. And the robot falls down. Here's another robot falling down. This was a CMU robot. Look at the size of its feet. So there were two teams from Carnegie Mellon in something called the DARPA Robotics Challenge. And we had a big argument. One team, my team, made a regular robot that looked like a human, had relatively human-sized feet. And these guys made giant feet. And they said, our robot's never going to fall down but their robot did fall down and my robot never fell down. So I was very happy at the end of this contest. <laughs> now, we still haven't figured out how to write programs that don't have bugs. This is a robot trying to feed somebody. It's not really working out. Lucky it wasn't yeah, a real person. Sure this is a person with an artificial yeah, arm. He turns it on and it goes yeah, so what we call unstable. Okay, so I'm, that makes me really scared of robots. So my idea was really simple. If we make the robot as lightweight as possible, it has very little mass, it's not gonna crush you, it has very little momentum, it's not gonna punch you hard. So if we make it light, all the problems go away. This is a, so one way to make robots very light is to make them inflatable. This is a simple inflatable arm that's helping this guy brush his teeth. It has a very simple hand that inflates to lock onto things. Okay. So this gets me uh, to the part of the story where uh, we helped inspire Baymax. And Disney, when it makes a movie, does research, particularly for the animated movies. And if you remember the movie Frozen, it had a lot of snow in it. And the animators who lived in Southern California, many of them had never seen snow or played in snow. So how are they gonna make a movie about snow if they've never seen snow? Well, they do research. In this case, they took a field trip to Norway and they played in the snow and filmed the snow, and that allowed them to make the movie Frozen. So when a director, a Disney director, a guy named Don Hall, wanted to make a movie that uh, Disney had just bought in Marvel, and so it had all these comic books, and the director wanted to make a movie about the comic book Big Hero 6, which had Baymax in it. Now, in the comics, this is what Baymax looks like. It was a giant transforming robot. Sometimes it looked like a robot, and sometimes it looked like a giant green lizard. So Don Hall said, well, I know I want to make a movie about a robot, and I'm going to visit a lot of famous robot labs around the world. 
And one of the labs he visited was my lab. And I showed him the inflatable robot stuff I just showed you. And I said, we're trying to make very lightweight robots that are to help people and be good medical robots and care robots. If you're going to touch people to help them dress or feed them or comb their hair or bathe them, then you really need to be safe, even if your computer crashes. And if we make the robot inflatable, then it's much safer than what I call a big metal monster. And that led, they went off and made the movie. And you saw this clip earlier on, but they invited me to Hollywood. <laughs> That's me in a tuxedo at the same theater they have the Oscars in. And I got to watch the movie for the first time and I cried. I was so happy that they made this movie about an inflatable robot. And on the right, you could see that I got a credit in the movie. So in theory, I should be Hello. listed in IMDB, Baymax, your personal the movie database. Companion. Okay, I wanted to stop here. Okay, and I have a bunch of bonus so slides, but I wanted to give people an opportunity to ask questions. That's Can probably the robots first explode? That's from Owen. Okay, Owen, you want to see a robot explode? We'll give you a robot that explodes. Er, okay. So, doo -doo 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 -doo. I need this thing to fill out. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay, so NASA had this robot sitting in a lab. All the scientists went out to lunch, and this is what happened. Boom. It blew up because its lithium battery, uh, you know, decided to blow up. Nobody was there. Nobody was using it. Nobody touched it. Here is the explosion in slow motion. Very exciting. And, you know, you might think, wow, that scares me. I don't want to have a robot in my house. <clears throat> but the reality is the same kind of batteries. Okay, now I got to stop it again. The same kind of batteries are used in your laptop and your laptop can explode the same way. Okay, what inspired Disney to make Big Hero 6? That's a question from Arian. And the answer is they wanted to have a robot that didn't look like any previous robot in a movie. So they had the Terminator and they didn't want a scary robot like the Terminator. They had Short Circuit from John or Johnny from the Short Circuit movies. And there were a lot of other movies like Frankenstein and stuff like that. So they wanted a movie, uh, a, a, a robot design that they'd never seen before. And the inflatable robot is something you haven't seen in a movie before. So they were very happy about that. And they were also very happy about a robot that takes care of people because Disney wants to have nice robots, not killer robots. So they were very happy with that part too. Okay, can robots take over the server of Roblox? Well, unfortunately, Owen, I don't know anything about Roblox. I have a former student named, uh, Daniel Wilson. Okay, and he writes books about robots that kill people. Uh, Robopocalypse is one. And the story is always the same, roughly. You tell the robot, hey, can you keep this area clean or ordered or, you know, whatever? And the robot goes off and it realizes, wow, it's the humans who make it dirty. It's the humans who make the mess. If I just kill all the humans, then I don't have a problem. Which by the way, is the same story as uh, 2001. It's a great movie, you should see it. So that's Daniel Wilson. You didn't think, you wouldn't think he's a psychopath, but there you go. And Robopocalypse, he, originally, Steven Spielberg 
bought the movie rights, uh, but that didn't work out. So now the guy who makes the Terminate, the, not the Terminator, the Transformer movies, Michael Bay is gonna turn it into a movie. So we're very excited about that. What programming language do I use from Powerful Minion? Answer, C or C++. How far away from having a healthcare companion are we? Well, uh, to be totally honest, there are healthcare companions in mostly Chinese hospitals at this very moment, taking care of people with coronavirus. And uh, what they do, you can very easily have a, a temperature measurement thing. You point at their forehead, you measure temperature, you can provide them with food, with drinks, you can help clean up after them if they throw up or something. You can change their bed. All of these things can be done with robots. So the idea is let's not have nurses and doctors have to touch or get close to the sick patients with the contagious disease as much as possible. Let's get the robots close to them. Now they still, nurses and doctors still have to do something, but it helps a lot if robot does most of the contact. And let's see if I go to the slide here. Okay, on the upper left, this is the robot from Boston Dynamics, and it's in the parking lot of a hospital in Boston, and it's it's got a picture of a guy's head on an iPad or something, and it walks up to the patients as they come in, and they it talks to them about how sick they are, and takes their temperature, and tells them where to go, and that means that the nurses who normally did that job don't have to be out here in the parking lot, don't have to be wearing all that protective stuff, don't have to be changing the PPE, the protective stuff, every time they see a new patient. So even something as simple as this, basically putting an iPad on a mobile robot is very useful. What can a young student do to prepare to have a career in this field in their younger school years that will help them be better able to enter this robotics field? So my advice is to, there are a lot of robot kits out there and to get one and, and build it. And, you know, in school you can take computer science. To be totally honest, you don't need to take a class to learn how to program, you can just do it. There are a lot of videos on YouTube. Sitting on my desk here is a little robot kit I'm working on for my next robot. And you can do the same thing. and the, when I was young, none of that was available. You couldn't even get a computer that could possibly be portable. Uh, but nowadays, 50 years later, you, you guys have all these resources and it's very cheap. You know, there's really nothing to stop you from just going out and doing stuff. You don't need to listen to anyone else. You don't have to have somebody else tell you what to do. You just look around on the web, find something that excites you and just do it. Okay, another question. Um, can you make something that breaks all the fundamental laws of physics? No. Next question. <laughs> what is your job called? You can tell people a little bit of how you get to your job. I think that'd be cool. I'm a professor. The yeah. way I got to be a professor is I first went to kindergarten. <laughs> I went to first grade. I was shocked in first grade to discover there were 12 grades. That seemed an awful lot to me. I got through the 12 grades, I went to college, then I went to something called graduate school, and then I became a professor. So I have, you know, in college, they have these weird names, you get a BA or an AB or whatever, and I have something called a PhD, which means I'm a doctor of philosophy, even though I can't help you medically. <laughs> All right, how do you make a robot like Baymax? Uh, well, to put it as simply as possible, Baymax is a balloon. You can easily make a balloon, you can buy balloons, you can make balloon animals. Then the second question is, well, how do I make it move? You can use scotch tape and string attached to the legs of the balloon, balloon animal to pull on it. And, you know, if you want to do that with motors and computers, you can just get some what are called servos uh, and hook them up to a computer 
there are companies out there. One is called Spark Fun. Another is called Adafruit. They try very hard to make that easy for you. Uh, and, you know, you, you essentially can make a puppet. Okay. What would be good resources or ways to learn more about robots for children? Like I say, uh, you know, going out there and doing something. Uh, I haven't looked into this recently, but the Lego Mindstorms, at least when I checked into it probably five or 10 years ago, it was really good. Uh, there may be new stuff out there. Uh, I certainly see a lot of toys in the toy store. I spend a lot of time in toy, toy stores uh, that are about uh, how to make simple robots and program them. And I, I imagine they're all good as starting points. Uh, I think there are a lot of kits out there. So I just buy stuff. <laughs> I buy a lot of toys for myself. Awesome. About how many robots have you created? I've made lots of copies of small, simple robots as well as big, expensive million dollar robots. I would say in terms of big, expensive robots, probably 10 and in small, tiny robots, probably a hundred. Awesome. Um, let's see. What was your favorite project that you have worked on? Uh, that's like asking a parent, which is their favorite child? And any parent knows to say, all my children are my favorite children. You want to tell us one of your favorite? I like all my robots. Okay. Okay. Um, what inspired you to learn about robot? I was very clumsy and chubby as a child. And all my brothers, and I had six brothers and one sister, were very athletic and agile and skillful. And uh, like one brother still has records at the college he went to for cross country running. And I was very frustrated as a child. I couldn't do anything, nothing worked. I sucked, I was terrible at sports. And so it's been a big deal for me to get machines to be skillful. It makes me feel really good. Now, my parents, my siblings, they all say, well, you know, making a robot walk, that's easy. Anyone can walk, and then they start walking. So if you're good at something, you probably don't appreciate how much skill goes into it. But if you're bad at something, then figuring out how to do it, facing that challenge, can be a lot of fun. Okay, cool. This one is philosophical. Do robots know what they're doing when they do it? So far, most robots are programmed to do what they're doing. And so, you know, at some level, they can only do one thing, or at least one thing at a time. We haven't really gotten to the stage where we put a robot somewhere and the robot actually wakes up in the morning and decides what to do that day. We're going to have to do that for robots we put in faraway places, like in space and under the ocean, where it's hard to communicate. And, you know, if you had a robot servant in your house, you actually don't want to be telling it what to do all the time. You'd like it to figure out what needs to be done and do it. With my robot vacuum cleaners, I can do that very crudely by scheduling them, telling them when to clean which room. But again, it's me telling them exactly what to do. Yeah, the question is, is machine learning from scratch actually a reality today? Or is it an algorithm that makes, that takes in human instructions based on an input or sensing? Okay, so you, you're ready to be a graduate student. You should skip <laughs> high school, college, go straight to graduate school. Okay, uh, there's a big argument as to how much a robot has to know in order to learn something. It is true that you can get a robot that knows pretty much nothing and you can get it to learn something pretty simple and it might take a long, long time. It has been demonstrated 
that you can start with a robot, or in this case, a program that knows almost nothing, and it can become the world champion in chess or Go or a Jap uh, Chinese chess or Japanese chess called Shogi and a number of other games. So those things really do learn from scratch but it costs a million dollars in computer time for each experiment. So really only a place like Google can do those experiments. Now, you can do a million dollars worth of simulation, but you cannot run a robot for a hundred years, which is roughly the equivalent in real life. The robot isn't gonna last that long. So I focused on stuff that can learn fast. And I showed you things where the robot watched a human do it. That's sort of what we call prior knowledge. And then it practiced it. And those things can learn very fast, less than 10 tries, as opposed to millions of tries. It is a big argument as to what the right way to go is. And I let me try this out on you. How do you open a jar, a glass jar, metal cap, right? Ah, oh, I can't open it. Most people pour hot water on it or hit it or pry it. And if you ask those people, did you invent that idea? They'll say, no, I learned it from someone else, typically their parents. Uh, there are very few skills that any human has that they didn't learn from somebody else. So to me, that's a compelling argument that we should be studying robots that know a lot so they can learn new things, not robots that have nothing in their head so they have to learn you know, from the, the beginning. You know, humans, are, each of our heads is filled with knowledge and that makes us really effective learners. I don't believe if you have an empty head, you're gonna be all that good at learning. Here's a robot that's learning from scratch. Okay, what's the question? Um, you said that you use C++ and C for your uh, programming. Um, and I know that those are like really old languages. Aren't there any new languages that um, you guys use for your programming? Okay, here's the deal. I'm an old person, so I'm going to use old programming languages. I learned C when I was about 20 years old. After a while, you slow down. You're not able to learn <laughs> new stuff. <laughs> so I'm still programming in C. All right. Uh, most young people want to program in Python. I have colleagues who are fixated on Java. I can't understand why. Uh, there's something called Julia that now everyone's very excited about. But the reality is, I don't think it matters what language you use. C is handy because we still have a lot of very simple processors and it can run very efficiently on those simple processors. But eventually every computer we work with will be super fast and it'll be irrelevant what language you use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think just to add on that, most of the time when people do lower level things, when I say lower level, meaning closer to the hardware and C tends to be used. Uh, something like more abstract, like Python and all that, if you do higher level stuff, you tend to use those type of things. So I think C and C++ are still the, uh, really the popular languages for robotics. All right, so next person, um, Giovanni. Is there a robot that can use a yo-yo? Yes. Uh, uh, so a good way to answer these kinds of questions is to go to uh google and say yo yo robot except i misspelled it and looks like we got a video a couple videos of robots yo-yoing and i taught a class on robot yo-yoing at one point i'm kind of seeing if i show up here 
anyway, the answer to your question is yes. And here is one. I don't know, it's kind of squashed video. And they cheated. They made the yo-yo very big. Is Baymax a real robot? Not yet. I hope one day to be able to build Baymax. Uh, the people in the movie or the animators at, for some things violated the laws of physics. So it's actually not possible to build the Baymax they show you in the movies, but it is possible to build something that can do a lot of what Baymax did in the movies. And Disney is working towards that, and I and others are also working towards that. Can we do a robot at home without having to go out? Yes, but you might have to order parts that come by mail or uh, buy stuff in essentially the grocery store or the drug store. And what do we have to buy to make a robot at home? So you can make a lot of things with cardboard and tape and string. And essentially, these are like puppets. They have a lot of strings. And you and your friends can hold the strings and move the strings and the robot moves. If you want to actually use motors, then you need to get uh, typically some servos and hook those up to a computer. There's a particular kind of computer called an Arduino that is very handy for that. I don't know if uh, the folks uh, that are hosting this teach people how to use Arduinos and drive servos, uh, but uh, it's very easy to do. We do offer robotics class. Uh, the only thing is because all of our classes are online, so we actually do robot in virtual environment, which is also cool. And are there like any robots that are that look and act like dinosaurs? Yes, and we want to say robot dinosaurs, and uh, you can actually looks like you can buy some. Well, here is a place where they make robot dinosaurs. I'm going to turn off the sound. And that's a scary eyeball. And there you go, a robot dinosaur. Wow. Wow. Are oh. they dangerous? Are they dangerous? Well, they're not dangerous like real dinosaurs in that they don't want to eat you. But they are big machines. If they stepped on you, you would not like it. And uh, pretty much all big machines are dangerous. So yeah, they're dangerous, but they're dangerous like a car is dangerous or a bulldozer is dangerous. OK, so for the robot that played air hockey, that those are all the parts. And those are the people who made it. So if you want to know what it takes to build a robot there it is all the parts just imagine have to curating like purchasing all the parts and put them all together you have to be very organized exactly yeah Let's see so this is actually the our talk today that was so awesome i saw so many new robots myself very very exciting and uh, we do these kind of talks on a regular basis. And several of you mentioned about Roblox. And we will actually have a Roblox talk in about 10 days on the 14th. So we actually have someone who works at Roblox will come in to talk about how, um, how people create Roblox. You might have wondered, like, you know, you may just be playing the game, but have you thought about how do people work at Roblox actually make Roblox? And he's also going to talk about how people um, create games um, on Roblox and then stories of the people who have been building some of the most popular games on Roblox. And of course, that he's also going to tell people uh, tell you how to um, start building Roblox yourself. Very cool. Awesome. Thank you so much again, Professor. And uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for attending. This is 
Awesome. And uh, I'm all excited. I'm going to try to build some, buy some robot kids myself and then build some robot as well. All right. All right. It's been a pleasure. Thanks very much. <laughs>